All right, ready to dive in. Today, uh, we're tackling how language began. It's a big question, right? Really old question. Yeah, it's a classic. We've got a, a whole stack of books here from, uh, well, some big names. Darwin, Chomsky, Pinker, Corbalis, Dunbar, Deacon, a lot of others too. Yeah, a real all-star lineup. And like any good team, they don't always agree. That's the fun part. So we're going to, we'll unpack how each of them sees this whole language origin puzzle. Exactly. Gradual evolution, sudden leap. What about the brain's role? Or gestures, social stuff, all these pieces. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with with Darwin. His book, uh, The Descent of Man, it, it kind of sets the stage, doesn't it? Yeah. Thinking about language evolving. Absolutely. Darwin was all about gradual development, natural selection, shaping everything. He saw even animals, right? Yeah. They have instincts, ways of communicating, like early versions of what we do. So like a bird song right. or a dog barking. That's on the path to like Shakespeare and, and, and writing, debating philosophy. Well, it's, it's more complicated than that. Darwin gives us a starting point, but human language, it's, it's got layers. That's where Chomsky comes in. Right, Chomsky. In Origins of the Modern Mind, at least how Donald summarizes it, he's got this sudden leap idea. Yeah, a kind of cognitive big bang language just appears. Chomsky's argument is the structure of language, especially syntax, how we put words together. It's too complex, he thinks, to have just slowly developed. So like our brain's got a software update and boom, we're talking about the weather, inventing the wheel. It's a compelling thought, but not everyone buys it. Some researchers, they say there's not enough proof for that kind of sudden change. They think even the really complex parts of language, they could have emerged gradually. Biology, culture, all mixed together. Hmm. Which is where Pinker comes in, right? The language instinct. Yeah. He seems to be trying to, to bridge those two ideas. Pinker's really interesting. He says, humans, we have this built-in capacity for language, a language instinct. It's, it's in our brains. But he also says that instinct needs input, like the actual language from our environment, especially when we're kids. So like the hardware's there, but we need the software, yeah. the specific language installed from the people around us. Perfect analogy, like a mm. computer, yeah basic operating system huh. but you got to add the programs to do different things makes sense and this this idea of language in the brain it's not like a metaphor right huh. there's physical stuff we can see oh absolutely pinker gets into the neuroscience of it points to specific areas crucial for how we process language how we create it broca's area wernicke's area these are big ones right and if those get damaged people can have like serious problems talking or understanding, don't they? Exactly. Damage there leads to very specific language issues, tells us those spots are key. But is there a language module, like a cluster of neurons just for language? Still debating that. Wow. So scientists are trying to like pinpoint where words are born in the brain. Mm -hmm. Wild. And that search takes us down some fascinating paths. Corbalis, in the recursive mind, he thinks a key difference in humans is this thing called recursion. Recursion? Yeah. Sounds, uh, sounds kind of complex. The word's fancy, but the idea is simple. It's like thoughts within thoughts. Sentences that build on themselves, like the cat that sat on the mat that's in the house is sleeping. We layer meaning. Oh, okay. So without recursion, our thoughts would be way simpler, like cat, mat, sleep. Exactly. And Corbalis argues this recursion thing, it's not just for language. It's like basic to how we think, planning, problem solving, even building civilizations. Hmm. So if it's so important, did it evolve gradually, like Darwin's idea, or did it did it pop up suddenly? Great question. Still being figured out. Yeah. Arbalis, he leans towards gradual, building up from simpler stuff in our primate ancestors. Okay, and while we're talking brain stuff, we got to mention Deacon, the mm -hmm. symbolic species, right? His work really makes you think. He's exploring how language and the brain, they might have actually co-evolved, shaping each other over time. He thinks symbolic communication, using symbols for abstract stuff. That was a driving force for our brains to grow. So language isn't just something we use. It actually helped build the tool that lets us use it. Trippy. It really is. Deacon says symbolic communication, it let humans think in totally new ways, building mental models of the world, sharing them. So language isn't just about information. It's about meaning, making worlds in our heads, connecting with each other deeper. It's, it's human. Exactly. Which brings us to a big question. How did that symbolic thought even emerge? Was it gradual, building on simpler communication? Or, like Chomsky says for language itself, was it a more sudden jump? Ooh, that's a good one. We'll have to dig into that more. But let's let's pause here for a sec. Think about what we've got. Darwin's gradual evolution, Chomsky's sudden leap, Pinker's instinct, Corbalis and recursion, 
Deacon's symbolic stuff. It's like a puzzle. A big, fascinating puzzle with each author giving us a different piece. And we're just getting started. And one piece of this puzzle that I find really interesting is uh, the idea that gestures, they might have been super important in how language got started. Oh, yeah, gestures. That yeah. makes sense to me. Like, even when we're on the phone, right, we still use our hands. And, and other primates, they use gestures a lot to communicate. Right, exactly. Corbalis in The Recursive Mind, he makes a strong argument for this. He talks about how good our hands are, all the nuance, how much we can say with a gesture. Even, uh, even sign language, the brain areas it uses, they're the same as for spoken language. Mm. It's like our hands were already a whole system, and then like on top of that, spoken language developed. Yeah, that's a cool way to think about it. You know, if you look at like other primates, their vocal tracts, their vocal cords, the shape of their mouths, it's not really built for the sounds we make when we talk, but their hands, those are amazing. So almost like uh, like our hands set our voices free, we could build a whole other layer of communication. That's a really nice way to put it, yeah. Developing really good communication with our hands, that might have been the foundation for, for spoken language. And it's not just hands either. Donald, in Origins of the Modern Mind, he's got this idea of mimetic culture in Homo erectus. Wait, mimetic culture? What What's that? So Donald's suggesting that Homo erectus, they were using a mix of stuff. Gestures, facial expressions, sounds, almost like like a really, really early kind of theater to get their ideas across. Oh, interesting. So more than just animal calls, but not full-on language yet. Yeah, that's the idea. This mimetic stage, maybe it was the bridge between basic communication and the really symbolic stuff we do. Hmm. And didn't they teach, uh, wasn't there that chimp, Washo, who learned sign language? Washo, right. That's such an important example because she learned hundreds of signs. Shows that primates, they can get symbolic communication even if they can't speak words the way we do. It gives us a glimpse of what those early mimetic ways of talking might have looked like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so gestures, mime. Then eventually voice comes in. This makes me think of the mother tongue hypothesis. The idea that, like, the sounds moms make to babies, that might be where it all started. Yeah, I like that theory. It connects language back to, like, one of the most basic bonds there is, mom and baby. Those early sounds, they would have been so important, right, for survival, for feeling connected. It makes me wonder, like, were those first mother tongues kind of like music? Lullabies, soothing sounds, before mm. they became words? That's a beautiful thought. And Dunbar, he actually takes this even further in his book, Grooming, Gossip, and the Evolution of Language. He argues that language, it evolved because we needed a better way to, like, stay connected in bigger groups. Oh, right. Dunbar. I remember that. Primates spend so much time grooming each other. It's how they bond, you know. But if your group gets too big, you can't groom everyone. Language, being fast, being flexible, that would be way more efficient. Exactly. Dunbar's theory is all about the social side of language. We didn't just evolve it to share facts, but to, like, keep the group together. Think about it. Gossip, stories, jokes. It's all about connecting. Like, language became the new grooming. A way to be social. To deal with all the complicated stuff that comes with living in a group. Yeah, I like that. And that takes us back to the idea of language as an adaptation. Something that evolved because it helped us solve problems. Right, like think about our ancestors. Hunting together, figuring out where the food is, warnings about danger, passing down their traditions. Language would have been key for all that. Absolutely. It gave us a huge advantage for surviving, but also for, you know, telling stories, making art and music, the things that make us human. Which brings us back to symbolic thought, Deacon and the symbolic species, right? Yeah, this is where it gets really interesting. Deacon says symbolic thought, that was a huge turning point. It let us think beyond just what we could see and touch and use symbols to represent abstract ideas. So like a light bulb moment. Oh. Our ancestors suddenly understood they could use symbols for stuff that wasn't right there in front of them. Not necessarily like a, a sudden aha. More likely it was gradual, different abilities coming together like the ones we've been talking about. And that led to this symbolic revolution. Okay, so what were those abilities? What made us different? Well, one big one was probably having a more complex social world. As groups got bigger, we needed better communication. Simple calls and gestures wouldn't cut it anymore. All those subtle social dynamics, who's in charge, who's friends with who, who's competing. You need more to express that. So we had to get better at talking to handle all that social stuff. Exactly. And as language got more complex, it probably changed how our brains work too, right? It's like a feedback loop pushing symbolic thought further and further. And it wasn't just about social stuff either. Language also meant we could share complex knowledge. 
how to hunt, how to make tools, how to understand the world around us. It became the ultimate sharing tool. Build on each other's ideas, learn from each other. Right, and that would made even better communication super important. The more complex the information, the more language had to evolve to keep up. Hmm, fascinating. So we had these social pressures, environmental pressures, and then our brains were already kind of ready for symbolic thought, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Recursion, thinking about the past and future, understanding relationships between things. Yeah, like all the pieces were there just waiting to be put together, something truly revolutionary. It's like we were baking a cake and suddenly realize, hey, we've got everything we need for a souffle. We just got to figure out the recipe and boom, symbolic thought. But how did we make that leap? How did we go from sounds and gestures to like full-blown symbols for abstract stuff? Now that's the million dollar question. Mm. And we may never have the complete answer, but there are clues, clues hidden in the way symbols work. Okay, now you've got me hooked. What kind of clues? Well, that's a story for the final part of our deep dive. We'll unravel those clues and explore how the very essence of symbols, that might be the key to understanding this huge change in how humans think. Okay, so back for the final part of our language origins deep dive. We've talked about Darwin, Chomsky, Pinker, a whole bunch of ideas. But the, the biggest mystery is still how how did we get symbolic thought? Right. It's the it's the heart of it all, isn't it? People have been trying to figure that out forever. And I, I don't know if we'll ever have the complete answer, but I think by looking at symbols and how they work, we can get closer. OK, so symbols. What even makes a symbol a symbol? Like what's the, the basic idea there? Good question. Think of the word tree. It's just sounds, right? But it stands for a real thing out there in the world. A tall, woody plant, branches, leaves. But there's no connection between the sound tree and the actual tree itself. That connection, it's totally arbitrary. So we've all just agreed that that sound means that thing, even though the sound itself, it doesn't look or act like a tree. Right. And that's what's so amazing about symbols. We can we can go beyond just what's right in front of us. Yeah. We can represent things that are abstract, things we can't even see or touch, things that maybe don't even exist. OK, so how did we get from understanding real stuff like a tree we can see? to understanding these abstract symbols. How did our ancestors make that jump? One idea is this thing called dual representation. It's, uh, it's the ability to know that something can be both a thing itself and a representation of something else at the same time. Hmm. Give me an example. Sure. A kid playing with a toy car. To them, it's just a thing to play with, right? But as they grow up, they start to understand that that toy car, it also represents a real car. Even though it's small, doesn't really work like a car. So the kid's holding two ideas at once. The toy is a toy and the toy is a symbol of a car. Exactly. And a lot of researchers think that being able to do that dual representation, that was crucial for symbolic thought. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors, they had to see beyond just the immediate use of a thing, understand it could stand for something else entirely. Like a rock isn't just for cracking nuts. It could also be a symbol for strength or something. Yeah, exactly. And once we had that ability, with symbols, so many possibilities opened up. We could talk about things that weren't right there, share ideas, build these whole mental models of how the world works, and pass those on to other people. Symbols became like the, the building blocks of culture, didn't they? Making meaning together, understanding each other. And that gave us huge advantages, right? Social cooperation, passing down knowledge. In the end, it helped us survive. It's wild to think that something as, as basic as a symbol could have such a big impact on, on, on the whole human species. Yeah. And make, it makes me think, like, are we still evolving in terms of how we use symbols? Think about technology now, emojis, memes, all these new visual languages online. Hmm. It's a great question. Are those new forms of communication making our symbolic abilities better or maybe simpler? Something we'll have to keep watching as we go deeper into this digital world. Well, it seems like this story of how language began, it's not over yet. We're still finding new clues, still trying to put the pieces together about how we went from basic communication to like full on thinking with symbols. And that's what I love about all this. There's always something new to learn, new mysteries to uncover. It's it's an amazing journey trying to understand what makes us human. Absolutely. And uh, to our listeners, we'll leave you with a final thought. We've been talking about gestures, sounds, how they might have been important for early language. So. How do you think all this digital communication, text, images, emojis, all mixed together, how's that changing language now? Is it making us even better with symbols or are we losing something along the way? Keep those minds thinking because the deep dive never really ends. 